Hey, we have been studying the life of Samson over the last four weeks, and we continue that today. And really what we've been trying to do is not so much to learn about his life, but to learn from his life. We want to move from just knowledge to wisdom that can be gained from his life. And we've looked at uh, mainly two things here. We've looked at his attitudes uh, that got him into so much trouble. Uh, we looked, you know, remember those three attitudes that were so, uh, so evident in his life. Uh, I want it. I deserve it. I can handle it. And how that just was his downfall. But we also talked about that he was a very emotion-driven person. And he made all his decisions based on emotion. Mainly, he, particularly, he had problems with anger and with pride. Uh, you know, some of the things that you and I have trouble with. And through these emotions and attitudes, Samson gave the devil uh, an avenue to ultimately destroy him. Now today we're just going to pick right up where we left off last week. Last week was just a grudge match. It was revenge back and forth between what Samson was doing and then the Philistines. Remember he went down to marry the woman. Uh, he made a bet with some of the people attending the wedding. He gave them a riddle. said, if you can answer the riddle, I'll give you 30 sets of clothes. If you can't, you've got to give me 30 sets. And then he, uh, they bribed his wife or blackmailed his wife, his wife-to-be, into finding out the answer. And he told her, then she told them. And then uh, he got angry, went out and killed 30 Philistines to pay his bet off with them, gave them the 30 sets of clothes. Well, then he storms off angry and goes back home through all of this. They give his wife away to someone else. He cools down, comes back and says, well, we gave your wife to someone else. He gets angry again, goes out, kills some more men. They, or he goes out that time and burns their wheat fields. Well, in retaliation, the Philistines then come in and kill uh, his, his father-in-law-to-be and his wife, what was going to be his wife, they killed him. Well, he then retaliates by going out and killing more Philistines. Well, he's a wanted man now, and so he flees back to his own country. You don't need to watch TV. You just need to read the Bible. This is a soap opera here. Uh, and so he flees back to his own country. They come with an army to get him. Uh, they, they think they've got him captured. He breaks loose, and uh, the only thing he could find to fight with was the jawbone of a donkey, picks that up and begins to fight with that. And when it's all over, a thousand dead Philistines are around him. Let me take a breath. And let's say it's an unbelievable story. At the end of this battle, then, he, he cries out. You can imagine how tired you would be after the end of something like this. He cries out to God and says, I'm dying of thirst. God answers back this way in Judges 15. We're going to stay in Judges 15 and 16 today, if you want to go ahead and turn there. And he says that God answers back with this in Judges 15, verses 19 and 20. Then God opened up the hollow place, uh, uh, the hollow place in Lehi. The water came out of it. When Samson drank, his strength returned and he revived. Now verse 20 says, Samson led Israel for 20 years in the days of the Philistines. Now, we do not want to go over that verse 20 too fast. We don't just want to read that and go on. Because that's basically the first good news we've had in Samson's life, is that he ruled for 20 years. Now, I don't know exactly how to take that, if, if it means that he got his act together after this point, and then for 20 years he basically kept his life, he followed God's uh, commands and was a, a good, good servant of God, or it just means through those 20 years, he served God, but he had some major failings during those times. I don't know. It didn't explain it to us, but we do know this. That would have been a great way to end the story. That Samson ruled for 20 years. He served God. He was a, a deliverer of Israel for 20 years. But it doesn't happen that way. For those of us that know the story... We know that it ends with him being captured by the Philistines. They gouge out his eyes, and he is made a prisoner. So what I want to talk today about is how does this happen? How do you have something like this happen? 
Well, the answer is pretty much, it's not a mystery. It happened to Samson the same way it happens to us. It doesn't happen all at once. Samson didn't ruin his life all at once. He ruined it one step at a time. He ruined it one bad decision behind the other. Judges 16, we're going to go right there straight to the scripture. Judges 16, Judge 16 verse 1 says this. One day Samson went to Gaza where he saw a prostitute. He went in to spend the night with her. And I did, that jumps off the page to me. One day. One day. I thought back to David. Remember when he was in the palace. It says during the time of year when kings went off to war but he stayed behind. It says, one evening, he looked off his roof and he saw Bathsheba. It's one day, one evening, one any day that these kind of things can start happening to us. One bad step and it begins. But we see that uh, one day he goes down to Gaza to see a prostitute. And you just got to go, what are you doing in Gaza, Samson? This is Philistine territory. This is a Philistine stronghold. Uh, this is this you can't get any more Philistine enemy territory than this. And what is he doing there? And what is he doing going to visit a prostitute when he is a Nazarite, when he is a follower of God? Verse 2. The people of Gaza were told, Samson is here. So they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the city gate. They made no move during the night, saying, At dawn we will kill him. So they know who he is. He has no business being there. And they see it as he's dropped right into our laps. Now, from what I understand, Gaza is about 25 miles from where Samson lived, his home territory. And it's not like there weren't other towns that he could have went to that if he wanted to get into trouble, if he wanted to find a prostitute, he didn't have to go to Gaza to do that. And you think and you say, why would he take such a risk? Why would he do this? And that's what we talked about the first week, wasn't it? We say, oh, why would you do something like that? People do it every day. The rich and the powerful, uh, the famous do it every day and risk everything they've got before a, te a temporary decision like this. And average people like you and I do it every day. To walk 25 miles... You can, this is the wonder of the internet, and you can Google this stuff. To walk 25 miles, it was approximately 52,800 of these steps. 52,800 steps to walk 25 miles to Gaza. That means that Samson had 52,800 opportunities to stop, to come to his senses and turn around and say, what am I doing? What am I doing going down to Gaza? I know better than this. But, but he didn't do it. And just like Samson, we don't plan on messing up our lives. None of us have a 10-year plan that says, well, I'm planning in 10 years to basically have ruined my marriage by uh, being unfaithful to my wife. No one says, well, in 10 years from now, my marriage is going to basically be dead because we have neglected each other so much and taken advantage of each other that there's very little feeling and love left for each other. No one says, well, I hope that with my children, I get them so busy and we stay so busy that we never build any real lasting relationships and we never get to share together because we're so busy doing everything else. Nobody has that plan. Nobody says, I'm going to buy enough stuff, and I'm going to keep buying enough stuff that when somewhere down the road, I'm going to have to declare bankruptcy because I've gotten so far in debt. Nobody plans on that, but it comes a step at a time. Well, that's what, what I want to say here and look at for a moment here is some of the steps that led to Samson's ruin. And one of those steps was that Samson taunted his enemy. Look at verse 3. But Samson lay there only until the middle of the night. Then he got up and took hold of the doors of the city gate, together with the two posts, and tore them loose, bar and all. He lifted them to his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. 
Now, this was no small task. This isn't like one of us saying, well, I'm going to rip the storm door off of our house and carry it to, carry it to town. No. This is ripping, off the, ripping out of the, the, the whole, right out of the wall, the city gates. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds of pounds just to carry this, and he does that. And it's not just that he did that. Uh, we, I've mentioned this before, and you've probably r- heard other teachers say this, that the gates and the walls of a city was a symbol of security. The bigger the gates, the bigger the walls, the more secure you were. And by Samson coming in and saying, you want to kill me? I'll show you. You're not safe from me. You can never get me. And he rips the gates off and carries them off. But why do we put ourselves in these situations? Why do we put ourselves to taunt the enemy? Why do we keep playing with fire? Why do we get so close to the edge? We know that those things will hurt us. We know that they're going to to bite us at some time, but that we taunt them. See how close we can get. I want you to look at these two verses here. John 10.10, Jesus warns us, he says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And then verse verse Peter 5.8 says, Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to, say that last word with me, devour. You can't get much clearer than the two warnings there of what the devil wants to do with us. Did any of you read uh, a month, a couple of months back now down in Columbia, the bear lady, uh, the lady that lived down there, and she got so comfortable, she lived down in the woods, and she got so comfortable with the wildlife that they've got pictures on the internet of her feeding bears. They're standing up taller than her, and she's feeding the bear. They said that they would come into her trailer. Well, she got missing, and they went to check on her, and they didn't find her in the trailer, but they found her in the woods completely torn apart. And they don't know yet whether the bears killed her or they just devoured her. We get, I don't think we start off to let things like that happen. I don't think we start off to ignore verses like this. But I don't know if we get arrogant, we get overconfident, we get lazy, we get proud. I, I don't know what it is. But we let our guard down and these type of things happen. Probably most of you had a high school sweetheart at some time. And if you were... Some of you, maybe many of you, married your high school sweetheart. Yeah, and that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. I had a high school sweetheart. The, my, the family, they welcomed me in. They treated me great. I'm still friends with some of the family members now. We still stay in contact with each other and all. The girl I dated, she had a, high, she had a curfew. And it was to be kept. It was enforced. And I always had her home. But if we got, and I was welcome in the home. But if we got back to the house and someone, her, not one of her parents were there, old Greg wasn't supposed to come in the house. And I tried to act all offended that he wouldn't trust me to be in that house alone with his daughter. But let me tell you something now as I've gotten older. He didn't need to trust me. He doesn't need to trust me or any other 17-year-old boy with hormones racing in the house with his daughter. He had a job to do, not to make me feel good because he trusted me. He had a job to raise his daughter and to protect her and to keep her out of trouble. I can look back now and see that. He didn't get lazy. He didn't get complacent. And he never bent that rule for good old Greg, for as good a boy as he was. He never bent that rule. Never. Hey, if we don't need and can't afford another car payment, then don't walk around the car lot. If you can't afford a new set of golf clubs, then don't look at them online. If, if you can't afford to make a, have a house remodeled and make home improvements, for goodness sake, don't watch all the shows on TV. 
about the home improvement. That has cost me so much money. Don't talk the end. Second thing that we see Samson does is that he repeated the same old sin. Repeated the same sins. Look at this verse, verse 4. Sometime later, he fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. Now, this is the third Philistine woman he has been involved with. None have worked out well for him, but he just keeps going back. There's an Old Testament proverb, and it is gross, it is brutal, it uh, is just blunt and to the point. But it speaks to this. This is straight from the Bible. Proverbs 26, 11 says, As a dog returns to its vomit, so a fool repeats his foolishness. And some of the translation says, repeats his folly. You can't get any clearer than that. You can't get any blunter than that. You can't get any grosser than that. But that is exactly what, what we're warned not to do, is to keep going back to the same old things. The first time was a disaster. The second time, it was an assassination attempt. Why does he think this time is going to be any different? Verse 5, the rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, see if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength and how we can overpower him so we may tie him up and subdue him. Each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. The same thing they did to the first Philistine woman, to blackmail her, to bribe her, that he was interested in, they did to her. She goes for the money and begins to try and get the secret out of him. Three times he would tell her a story. He says, tie me up with, with uh, seven fresh bowstrings and I'll be as weak as any other man. She ties him up and this says, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And he would break them just like her nothing. And she said, oh, why, why won't you tell me the truth? And he said, okay, you tie me up with new ropes. I'm as weak as any other man. She ties him over the rope. said, the Philistines are upon you. He breaks free just like nothing. The third time, he says, if you, uh, he does it, does it again. He says, if you'll weave my hair into the loom, a, a loom here. And he said, you notice he's getting a little closer to the truth here. He's getting a little closer to the line. Now he's brought his hair into this. He said, if you weave my uh, seven braids into the loom. I'm as weak as any other man. She does that. He breaks loose again and breaks free. Look at verse 13. I'm sorry, verse 15. Then she said to him, how can you say I love you when you won't confide in me? This is the third time you have made a fool of me and haven't told me the secret of your great strength. Verse 16. With such nagging she prodded him day after day after day after day after day. No, I'm sorry. Un until he was tired to death. We have all wondered if it was medically proven that you can be nagged to death. We are about to find out. Ladies or men, you have great strength, great power at your disposal. Use it wisely if you're a nagger. But seriously, there's a lesson here for us here. If you're not strong enough to be able to take it, then don't expose yourself to it. If somebody can break you down, then you don't need to be there. You don't need to be in those situations. And another lesson and warning for us here is this. If you've got somebody that's trying to talk you into something you know you don't need to do, then you don't not only not need to listen to them, you don't need to have them around. You don't need to be with somebody that's constantly trying to talk you into something that you don't need to do. Verse 17. So he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head, he said. Because I have been a Nazarite set apart to God since birth. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me, and I would become as weak as any other man. Now, this is another thing. I told you that there's been few, a few things in the story of Samson that I've just overlooked. I've read them many times, but just overlooked a, a hidden meaning there. And this is one. 
This is a moment of clarity in Samson life, in Samson's life. We read this verse, and what we instantly grab hold to is he gave away his secret of his strength, that it was his hair. But the moment of clarity here is that he reveals, he says it out loud, what he was meant to be. He says, I, because I have been a Nazarite set apart to God since birth. There, out of his own mouth, as he's revealing his great secret, he says, I wasn't made for this. I was made to be a servant of God. I was made to be a follower of God. I wasn't made for this here. This is one of those moments that Samson had in his life and that we have in our lives where we stop and go, wait a minute. When we're involved in some sin or we're, we're about to get involved and we just have that moment of clarity and go, this isn't me. This isn't who I'm supposed to be. This isn't the kind of things that I'm supposed to be involved with because I'm a child of God. That we stop and say, wait a minute, I can't do this. And we say, I'm sorry, I've, I've got to leave. I, I've got to get out of here. And we get away. People ask and wonder, and I know you've done it before too, how can I stay on the path? How can I stay true to God? How can I keep my commitment to Him and not go back to those same old sins over and over again? How can I keep from getting pulled away from God? If we would spend some time in a moment of clarity like this, remembering this is not who I am. This is not who I was made for, what I was made to do, that I am a child of God. I am a servant of God. I am a warrior of God. And I'm not to be brought down by the devil or anybody else. I am to stand up for God. If we would have those moments of clarity and realize just who we are, maybe we wouldn't fall so easy. I was talking with Stephen Lilly and I were talking this week, and he just brought it up. He says, Greg, he says, you know, we celebrate birthdays. We celebrate anniversaries. We have uh, parties to announce the birth of a child. We have a party for this and a party for all of these things. He says, but you notice we don't celebrate the day we gave our life to Christ. We don't celebrate the day that we became a Christian, the day that we were baptized. He says, why don't we celebrate that more? And I, all I could say to Stephen was, I don't know. But it's a great thought. Think, just take this in for a second. If we were to celebrate, remember that I gave my life to Christ. That's not who I am anymore, what I was. That's not what I am anymore. And I won't go back. If we celebrated that my birth is in Christ, would it change how we live? But for tragically, for Samson, he didn't grasp this moment of clarity Verse 18, when Delilah saw that he had told her everything, she sent word to the rulers of the Philistines, come back once more, he has told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with the silver in their hand. Having put him to sleep on her lap, she called a man to shave off the seven braids of his hair and so began to subdue him and his strength left him. This is the third step I just want to mention today, that Samson assumed his sin would never cost him. He assumed that it would never catch up. Verse 20 says, Then she called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. I can get away with it. I've been caught before and I can talk my way out of it. Oh, she'll be mad, but I'll just say I'm sorry. So eventually she'll get over it. She'll give me another chance. Oh, I'll get written up for it, but I won't lose my job. And we think we can, keep, we can just keep on, and we can keep on, and it's never going to catch up with us. I've always thought that this is one of the saddest verses in the Bible that Samson's life had become such a life that he did these things over and over that he thought he could just pull it off one more time, that it wouldn't cost him, that he could keep taking advantage of God, 
that he didn't even realize that he had removed himself from God's protection, that the Lord had left him. Verse 21, Then the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, and took him down to Gaza. Binding him with bronze shackles, they set him to grinding in the prison. And this is doing the work of an animal, an oxen turning the big wheel. He finds himself in the lowest position possible, the strongest man in the world, now in the position of a mere animal. Chained, blind, humiliated publicly, and doing the work of a common animal. 52,000. 800 steps. 52,800 opportunities to stop. And I said a few minutes ago that it was a moment of clarity for Samson. And I have one for you and I today. And that's this. Which step are you on? Which step are you on? Step, are you on a path that's stepping away from God? Do you see a path that's leading away from God instead of leading to him? You may be on step one today. You may be on four or five. You may, you may be on step 6,540. You may be in a, in a path, in an early walk to Gaza, you know, where it's just the spiritual disciplines are being left behind, that you read the Bible less, that you pray less, that you think about God less and you, think, and you think more about yourself. It may still be a hidden sin where you're just thinking about the sin in your head. You know, the I want it, I deserve it, I can handle it. Or it may be a full-blown walking away from God. But this is where we need to be honest with ourselves. Where are we at on this walk? You see, we're only as strong as we are honest. And if you can't be honest with yourself, then we can't then God can't help you. What we're talking about here is repent. That, that's the key word here. You know, repent is not just the remorse over sin and doing wrong things, but sin is actually a Greek word that is pictured that as you're walking, that you come to a place and you stop and you turn around. Repent means to turn and go the other way. Repent is what Samson had an opportunity to do 52,000 times in one journey, was turn around. And that's what God is calling called Samson to. It's what he's calling us to. And what a better definition when we're talking about the life of Samson than to compare it to ours, that we have the time, we have the opportunity to repent and avoid that walk of shame. If we stop on step one or stop, uh, or step 6,000, if we'll turn around, we will find God is still back, is still there. He is still there. Listen to one last verse, verse 22. But the hair on his head began to grow again after he had been shaved. That's a verse of hope. That's a verse of promise. That's a verse of grace. That's a verse that it's never too late. That's a verse of second, third, fourth, fifth chances. If we will turn around, we're going to find God is still there. But we got to turn around to find him. And today, as always, we offer that opportunity to turn around, to say, I'm going to start walking away from God, and I'm going to make a step today that says, wait a minute. I'm going to turn and start walking to God and finding him there. And let that be the day. Let today be the day that you mark that it's your anniversary uh, that you will look at always and say, that's the day I became somebody else, that I became somebody for God. 